Having made his diagnosis and being ready to proceed to the handling of the case, the exorcist has to achieve three things. He must repair his patient's aura, clear the atmosphere of his environment, and break his contact with the forces that are causing the trouble. These three things are interdependent, and not one of them is first or last. The first thing to do when dealing with an occult attack is to make a temporary clearance of the atmosphere and so gain breathing space in which to reform the shattered ranks. This is more readily achieved by an organized ritual than by unaided willpower. Any act performed with intention becomes a rite. We can take a bath with no more in mind than physical cleanliness, in which case the bath will cleanse our bodies and no more. Or we can take a bath with a view to ritual cleanliness, in which case its efficacy will extend beyond the physical plane. We therefore perform certain physical actions not only as a means of clearing etheric conditions, but also as a means of definitely affecting astral ones through the imagination, a very potent weapon in all magical operations. Physical objects become impregnated with etheric emanations and retain them for considerable periods, as a knife will retain a smell of onions and taint everything that is cut with it. These emanations, magnetism, as they are called in the terminology of occult science, profoundly affect any sensitive person who is in contact with them. There is something in the old superstition that it is unlucky to place boots on a table. It is equally inadvisable to place outdoor garments on a bed. You do not know whom you have rubbed shoulders with in bus or train, so why give their magnetism a chance to contaminate your sleeping place? Fortunately for all of us, magnetism is a very fugitive force. And although it may be potent when fresh, it soon fades unless it has been deliberately created by means of ritual. The terrible atmosphere that surrounds the victim of an occult attack and permeates all his belongings is not difficult to get rid of, though it will rapidly reform unless the conditions which gave rise to it are cleared up. The most effectual way of getting rid of magnetism is to move to a fresh place, taking nothing of one's old belongings with one. This, however, is a counsel of perfection for most people. Fortunately, there are other devices which enable us to attain our ends nearly as effectually. If it be in any way possible, let the victim of an occult attack move temporarily to another environment, taking with him as few of his belongings as possible, and let him make the move in new clothes or in clothes that are just back from the cleaner. Let him, moreover, keep his whereabouts a secret, as far as it is convenient for him to do so. There is an old superstition that a witch can be thrown off the trail by crossing running water. It is my opinion that many of these old folk beliefs have a basis in fact, however overlaid by superstition they may have become. I once had a curious experience which gives support to this opinion. I was about to take part in an important piece of occult work to which I knew there would be opposition. A friend who was concerned in the matter asked me to dine with her on the night before the day fixed for the proceeding. We were both conscious of tension in the atmosphere, and she suggested that I should remain the night at her flat instead of returning to my own, informing no one of my whereabouts in order to throw the attack off the trail. The maneuver was not wholly successful, and we had a rather trying night, and I was conscious of a good deal of psychic tension the next day. I decided, therefore, to walk to the appointed place across Hyde Park, in order to refresh myself. When part of the way across, I suddenly felt that the tension relaxed, and I was able to go through the work in hand without interference. I told my friend of this experience, and she questioned me as to where I was when it took place. 
We looked up this spot on a map and found that I had just crossed the underground conduit which takes the overflow from the serpentine. I did not know of the old superstition concerning running water. Neither did I know of the existence of the conduit. Nevertheless, the sense of relief was sufficiently marked to cause me to mention it when I saw my friend again and to be able to indicate the spot where it had occurred. We have very little exact knowledge concerning these subtle forces, which are the basis of both occult attack and spiritual healing, but we have good reason to believe that in their nature they are closely analogous to electricity. They are not inanimate forces, however, but have in their nature something that is akin to life, though of a low energy. It has been my experience that if we work on a blended analogy of electricity and bacteriology, we get pretty near the facts, as near at any rate, as our present state of knowledge permits. In other words, if we act as if thought possessed the combined qualities of electricity and bacteria, we shall have a sufficiently accurate method of steering by dead reckoning in the absence of certain knowledge and actual sight. If we consider the various methods used in folk magic of all ages and races, we shall observe that they are in agreement with these hypotheses. Running water, we know, has peculiar electrical qualities, as is witnessed by its effect on the divining rod in the hands of a sensitive person. Whatever it may be that affects the diviner is probably the same thing that affects the occult attack. When we recall, moreover, that running water will throw hounds off the scent just as effectually as it will the alleged witch, we may feel that we cannot be accused of gross superstition if we give the old folk tradition a trial and note the results. Water, again, is the vehicle of purification. It is used in the rite of baptism by the church and in the preparation of the place by the occultist about to perform a ceremony. Strictly speaking, there should be a trace of salt in the water, thus employed and both salt and water are blessed with powerful invocations when the priest is preparing holy water. Whether for a baptism or for placing in the holy water stoop, for the use of the congregation. As far as the occultist is concerned, salt to him is the emblem of the element of earth. It is also a crystalline substance. And crystalline substances, in their different forms, receive and hold etheric magnetism better than anything else. Water, on the other hand, is the emblem of the psychic sphere. These two realms between them contain by far the greatest part of occult evil. It is rare indeed that spiritual wickedness in high places will reach up as far as the airy realms of mind or the fiery realms of spirit. If we want to get in touch with or operate upon a particular sphere, we use as base a substance appropriate thereto. Consequently, a solution of salt and water makes a better base than either salt or water could do separately, because it enables us to cover the whole of this sphere of probable operations in a single act. It may be interesting to note concerning the magical properties of crystalline substances. That crystals are used in wireless apparatus to pick up the subtle vibrations of the ether. Once again, we are close upon the trail of our electro-bacteriological analogy. It is an excellent plan when trying to break an undesirable psychic contact to immerse oneself in a bath of water that has been especially consecrated for the purpose, redressing in new or at least clean clothing afterwards. 
and if it be by any means possible, moving into a different room. If this cannot be done, move the bed into a different position, taking care to turn it at a different angle, that is to say. If you have been in the habit of sleeping lying north and south, place your bed so that you will now be lying east and west. The following prayers may be used for the blessing of the salt and water, pointing the first and second fingers at the salt. I exercise the creature of earth by the living God, by the holy God, by the omnipotent God, that thou mayest be purified of all evil influences in the name of Adonai, who is Lord of angels and of men. Extending hand over salt, creature of earth, adore thy creator. In the name of God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior, I consecrate thee to the service of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Pointing first and second fingers at the water, I exercise the creature of water, by the living God, by the Holy God, by the omnipotent God, that thou mayest be purified from all evil influences, in the name of Elohim, Sabawa, who is Lord of angels and of men extending hand over water. Creature of water, adore thy creator. In the name of God, the Father Almighty, who decreed a firmament in the midst of the waters and of Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior, I consecrate thee to the service of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Casting the salt into the water, we pray thee, O God, Lord of heaven and earth, and of all in them that is both visible and invisible, that thou mayest stretch forth the right hand of thy power upon these creatures of the elements and hallow them in thy holy name. Grant that this salt may make for health of body and this water, for health of soul, and that there may be banished from the place where they are used every power, of adversity and every illusion and artifice of evil, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. The water thus consecrated may be used as a bath, or for making the sign of the cross upon the forehead, or for sprinkling about a place. When thus using it, the following prayer may be employed. In the name which is above every other name, and in the power of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, I exercise all influences and seeds of evil. I lay upon them the spell of Christ's holy church, that they may be bound fast as with chains, and cast into outer darkness, that they trouble not the servants of God. In pointing or making the sign of the cross, the first and second fingers, are extended in the third and fourth, are bent towards the palm of the hand and the thumb laid upon their nails when the hand is extended in blessing over the salt and water. It is held flat, fingers together and parallel, the thumb stretched at right angles to the forefinger. If there is sufficient occult force at work to produce physical phenomena, it is very advisable to take precautions to prevent materializations taking place. There are certain substances which experience has proved to be effectual in preventing the condensation of etheric energy from taking place. Consecrated salt dissolved in vinegar and placed in saucers about the room will cope effectually with low degrees of force, but for higher potencies nitric acid is the best thing to use a small quantity being poured into a saucer and exposed to the air. It is best to use it well diluted to prevent accidents, and it is not the strength of the acid in the saucer that is efficacious, but its evaporation into the air, and it will evaporate just as well when diluted as when neat. In what manner it works, I have not the slightest idea but its value is well known among psychic experimenters. 
The methods of occult attack employed in modern Europe are exclusively mental, so far as my experience of them has gone at any rate. That is to say, they work by the mind, on the mind, and only affect physical conditions incidentally. In the East, and among primitive people, however, other aspects have to be considered, as a much more etheric type of magic is in use under primitive conditions of life and upon virgin soils. For these etheric operations, material substances are required in order that the magnetism attached to them may be made use of hair combings, nail parings, cast-off clothes, objects, and familiar use all contain magnetism. Consequently, care should be taken to see that such things are effectually disposed of when discarded. Combings and nail parings should be promptly burnt. Cast-off clothing should never be allowed to go out of the possession of the owner till it has at least three days' exposure to sun and air in the open. The magnetism will be more effectually dispelled if the garments be laid on the earth, especially freshly turned earth, than if hung on a line. The same applies to furniture, the chair that has been the accustomed seat, and above all things, the bedding should be thoroughly aired and sunned before they are parted with. The same precautions are useful if any second-hand article has been purchased. Methods of Defense 2 There are two types of practical psychic work which may be used separately or in combination, the latter method, in my opinion, giving by far the best results, though the exponents of each are apt to decry the other. The method which we will distinguish as the meditative method consists of meditation upon abstract qualities such as peace, harmony, protection, and the love of God. It is the method of the New Thought School, and its value lies in the harmonizing effect it has upon the emotional state and its counteracting of harmful auto-suggestions. The other method, which we will call the Invocative, consists in the invocation of external potencies and the employment of formal methods for the focusing of their force. This method has many gradations of complexity and an infinite variety of techniques. It ranges from the simplest prayer, which calls upon Christ with the sign of the cross, to the most elaborate rituals of exorcism, performed with bell, book, and candle, the essence of the system lies in the attempt to dissect out from the general force of good the particular aspect of energy that is needed, and the use of some symbol to act as the magical vehicle of that force upon the plane of form. This symbol may be a mental picture of the blue robe of Our Lady. It may be the action of making the sign of the cross. It may be the consecrated water sprinkled for token of cleansing. Or it may be some object specially magnetized to act as a talisman. In the invocative method, the aim is to concentrate the force, and therefore some symbol of form has to be employed. In the meditative method, the aim is to escape beyond the bounds of form into the atmosphere of pure spirit, too exalted for evil to enter, and therefore the use of any form or ritual is eschewed as calculated to prevent the soul from rising into this pure air. In my opinion, and with all due respect to the practitioners of this latter method, much better results would be obtained if the invocative method with its utilization of the efficacy of formulae were used to enable the mind to climb into the pure air of spiritual consciousness, where no evil is. It is only those who are highly trained in meditation who can rise on the plains unaided. It is exceedingly difficult to take off from sense consciousness without the use of some kind of psychological device to act as a springboard. There seems to be very little object in refusing for purely academic reasons to avail ourselves of a method of proven efficacy. 
If we realize that the use of forms and symbols is merely a psychological device to enable the mind to get a grip on the intangible, we shall not fall into the error of superstitious observances. A superstition has been defined as the blind use of a form whose significance has been forgotten. On the other hand, we shall be unwise to rely exclusively upon formal or ceremonial methods, unless at the same time we use meditative methods, in order to purify and harmonize our own consciousness. If we neglect this aspect of our work, we shall reinfect, by our own vibrations, the magic circle as fast as we have cleared it. It is not much use sealing a circle with the protective names if we allow a panic-stricken imagination to run riot, picturing every conceivable kind of evil and leaving blank spaces for the possibility of inconceivable kinds. Equally, however, we shall find it very much easier to perform the harmonizing meditation if we are working within the protection of a magic circle. To attempt to perform the work of exorcism solely by means of meditation is like raising a weight by the unaided effort of our two hands. The employment of the magical method resembles the use of a lever or a pulley or a block. Our muscles are still the sole source of energy but by the utilization of mechanical principles, we have redoubled their power. Let us then, in meditation, use symbols to concentrate our attention. We shall find this very much easier than meditation in terms of abstract thought. Indeed, in times of stress and crisis, abstract thought may be impossible for us unless we are very experienced in its use. But we shall seldom reach a state when we cannot picture the cross and call upon the name of Christ. Occult attacks may be divided into two types, those which take place by means of thought forms and those which operate by means of a current of force. But even in the latter case, the current of force soon gathers to itself or germinates thought forms congenial to its nature. Therefore, in every psychic disturbance, the thought form is a factor which has to be considered and dealt with, and which, in fact, forms the readiest means of diagnosis, for it is by the perception of the associated thought forms that the experienced psychic is able to detect the nature of the attack. Thought force is a thing which has no relation to geographical position, but is a matter of pure consciousness and of tuning in to its keynote. We can pick up the forces of dead faiths a thousand years after the death of their last votary, and upon the opposite side of the globe to that in which they flourished. But thought forms are a different matter. They have position in space, and although they can be moved about with the speed of thought, and can be withdrawn to the subtlest level of the astral, and there anchored to an idea, and thus prevented from impinging upon the planes of form for all practical purposes. Nevertheless, although they do not occupy space, they can be referred to definite positions in space. They can, for instance, be associated with a particular object, and will follow that object about, remaining within its magnetic field. The immediate magnetic field is anything from 12 to 30 feet, the remote magnetic field from 100 to 300 yards. Powerful holy centers like Glastonbury or Lourdes have a bigger magnetic field than this, extending possibly to a couple of miles. They are also interconnected among themselves by lines of force. These things have to be taken into account in practical occult work. When we are confronted by a disturbing influence emanating from a focus of power, such as the site of an old temple, 
We have got to deal with the remote magnetic field by means of ceremonial, as this is a method that can only be used by a high-grade initiate. We will not consider it here. For all practical purposes, in a psychic attack, it is the immediate magnetic field that has to be considered. The best method to deal with this is to make a magic circle. A mere banishing by itself is not so effective as a banishing performed within a circle, because the circle will effectually prevent the banished forces from flowing back again. There are various methods of performing this operation, but the principle of all valid ones is the same. The more potent conjurations cannot be given in these pages, because their effective use depends upon the grade of initiation possessed by the person who proposes to use them, and to possess a formula without the grade to which it belongs is as unsatisfactory as possessing a gun without any knowledge of shooting. The formula I will give will be found effectual for all ordinary conditions. Extraordinary conditions can only be dealt with by a person who has had experience. In making the magic circle, the operator stands upright, facing east. He faces east because the magnetic current on which he proposes to operate runs from east to west. His first procedure must be to steady his own vibrations and purify his aura. In order to do this, he makes the Kabbalistic cross on breast and brow. Touching his forehead, he says, To thee, O God, touching his solar plexus, be the kingdom, touching his right shoulder, and the power, touching his left shoulder, and the glory, clasping his hands, unto the ages of the ages. Amen. By this formula, the operator affirms the power of God as sole creator and supreme law of the universe to which all things must bow. And he establishes this formula magnetically in his aura by the action of making the sign of the cross upon himself. This sign is not an exclusively Christian symbol. The equilimbed cross refers to the four quarters of the globe and the four elements, and the formula associated with it proclaims the dominion of God over these and thereby occultly formulates his kingdom within the sphere of the operator. The operator next imagines himself to be clasping in his right hand a large cross-handled sword, such as is depicted in pictures of crusaders. He holds it point upright and says, In the name of God, I take in hand this sword of power for defense against evil and aggression, and imagines himself to be towering up to twice his natural height, a tremendous armed and mailed figure vibrating with the force of the power of God, with which he has been charged by his formulation of the sword of power. He now proceeds to draw the magic circle upon the floor with the point of the sword of power, and he should see in his imagination a line of flame following the point of the sword consisting of small flames, such as spring up when methylated spirit is split and ignited, but of a pale golden color. A little practice should enable this circle of light to be formulated effectually. Keep on going round the circle until it is formulated. The circle should always be drawn diocil. That is to say, from east to south, to west to north, in the same way that the hands of a clock would move, were the clock laid face upwards on the floor. The contrary way is widdershins, the way in which the witches danced at the Sabbaths. The diocil movement affirms the rule of God's law in nature, because it is the way of the sun. The Widdershins movement repudiates God's rule over nature by moving against the sun. In resisting an occult attack, the whole formula should be tuned to the keynote of asserting God's dominion over all existence. The aim of the operator being to align himself with cosmic law 
and cause the power of God to deal with the interference. The circle being formulated, the operator ceasing to visualize the sword, but still visualizing the circle, clasps his hand in prayer, and raising them above his head towards the east, prays, May the mighty Archangel Raphael protect me from all evil approaching from the east. Turning to the south, he repeats the same formula and prayer to Michael. Turning to the west, he invokes Gabriel. Turning to the north, he invokes Uriel. Facing to the east again, and thus completing the circle, he repeats the formula of the Kabbalistic cross. This formulation of the magic circle is especially valuable for protecting the sleeping place, the circle being drawn around the bed. It is not necessary to move about the room or shift the furniture in order to draw the circle. It will be formulated wherever it is visualized to be. It is necessary to reaffirm this circle each time the tides change, that is to say. A circle made after sundown will hold good till sunrise, and a circle made after sunrise will maintain its potency till sunset, after the circle has been affirmed a number of times. In the same place, its influence will persist for a considerable period, but it is advisable to reformulate it morning and evening during the active phase of an attack. Incense burned within the circle is very helpful, but care has to be exercised in the choice of an incense. In dealing with elementals or non-human entities, the pentagram or pentalpha is the best weapon. This is a five-pointed star drawn in a particular way, pointing the first and second fingers of the right hand and folding the others into the palm and touching their tips with the thumb. Proceed to draw the pentagram in the air, keeping the elbow stiff and swinging the arm at full length. Start with the right arm across the body, the hand about the level of the left hip, the extended fingers pointing downwards and outwards. Swing it upwards as if drawing a straight line in the air, until the fingers point straight upwards above the head at arm's length. Now sweep it down again, keeping the elbow stiff until the hand occupies the corresponding position upon the right side to that from which it started on the left. You have now drawn a gigantic V upside down. Next, swing the hand across the body on a rising incline until it is stretched at a level with the left shoulder pointing to the left. Bring it across the body horizontally until it is in the same position on the right, fingers pointing away from the body. Now swing it downwards across the body till the hand has come back to the point by the left hip once it started. This is an exceedingly potent sign, the value of the five-pointed star. The symbol of humanity is widely known among occultists, but its potency depends upon the manner in which it is drawn. The method I have given is the correct one for banishing. When it is not possible to seal the room, it is a very useful thing to be able to seal the aura. Stand upright and cross yourself by touching forehead, breast, right shoulder, and left shoulder, saying, By the power of the Christ of God within me, whom I serve with all my heart, and with all my soul, and with all my strength, extend your hands forward as far as you can reach at the level of the solar plexus. Fingertips touching, then sweep them round the back and touch the fingertips together again behind you, saying, I encompass myself about with a divine circle of his protection, across which no mortal error dares to set its foot. This is an old monkish formula. It is very effectual, but its potency only lasts about four hours. There are various other devices which are useful not only in dealing with psychic attacks, but in any case of undue influence or domination. If you have to interview persons whose influence you find overwhelming, imagine that they are separated from you by a sheet of plate glass. You can see them and hear them, but their magnetism cannot reach you. Visualize this sheet of glass until it appears to you to be absolutely tangible. If you have to associate with persons who distress you, 
but are not actually interviewing them. Imagine that they are separated from you by a brick wall and say to yourself, you just aren't there. I can't see you or hear you and you simply don't exist. When dealing with a person who saps your vitality, interlace your fingers and lay your folded hands upon your solar plexus, keeping your elbows pressed against your sides. Keep your feet touching each other. You have thus contacted all your own terminals and made of your body a closed circuit. No magnetism will go out from you while you maintain this attitude. Your friend will probably complain of your lack of sympathy, however kindly you may speak. If anyone tries to dominate you by gazing intently into the eyes, do not attempt to return gaze for gaze, for this only leads to an exhausting struggle, in which you may get the worst of it, but look steadily at the spot, just above the base of their nose, between the inner ends of the eyebrows. If you are merely dealing with an ordinary bully, you will immediately have the upper hand. If, however, your antagonist has knowledge of mind power, you may not be able to dominate him, but he certainly will not be able to dominate you, and the result will be a stalemate. Do not attempt to dominate him. Merely keep your eyes on the spot and wait for him to weary of his attempt to dominate you. You will not have long to wait. By the use of the methods described in the preceding pages, any person of normal courage and mentality, provided he avoids drugs, alcohol, and long periods without food, can, if he does not lose his nerve, wear down any ordinary psychic attack, or in the case of attacks of abnormal potency, can at least ensure himself time to make good his escape and seek help. The sacraments are also a most potent source of spiritual power, and a church where the blessed sacrament is reserved, or which is sufficiently old to have been consecrated before the Reformation, is an effectual sanctuary. Method 3. Rapport, once established, other things beside the general feeling tone can be shared. Actual ideas can be transferred from one mind to another as in telepathy and in the same way vital force can be transmitted. It is this fact which is the explanation of certain types of spiritual healing. When etheric vitality is being transmitted, it is necessary that the persons concerned should be within the immediate magnetic field of each other. But when astral force is in question, this is not necessary. Transmission is independent of space. To astral vision, the telepathic link appears as a ray of light, a shining cord, or some similar thought form, because it is in this form that it is usually formulated by the person who is making the magnetic link. It sometimes happens, however, that if the operator has a high grade of initiation, that instead of connecting the ray direct to the person with whom he desires to be in touch, he will formulate an astral animal at the end of it, which he transfers a modicum of his own consciousness. This animal form is called a watcher. It does not act on its own initiative unless attacked, when it defends itself according to the nature of the species in whose likeness it is made. The use of a watcher is to obtain a record of what is transpiring, without the necessity of focusing consciousness thereon. When the psychic substance of the watcher is reabsorbed by the adept, he becomes aware of the content of the watcher's consciousness. The disadvantage of this method lies in the vulnerableness of the watcher to psychic attack, and the fact that its projector is affected if it is injured or disintegrated. In dealing with a thought form, always bear in mind that it is the product of the imagination, and is in no sense self-existent. What the imagination has made, the imagination can unmake. If the maker of a thought form has thought it into existence by picturing it imaginatively, you can equally well think it out of existence by picturing it clearly and imagining it bursting into a thousand fragments, or going up in flames, or dissolving into water, and being absorbed by the soil. That which is thought into existence by the imagination can be thought out of existence by the imagination. 
If what was taken for a thought form resists destruction by this method, it is probably an artificial elemental. Now there are two such elementals, one kind being ensouled by the invocation of elemental essence into a thought form, and the other by the projection of something of the magician's own nature into it. If it is ensouled by the elemental essence, the use of the pentagram will serve to banish it, but if it is of the kind that is ensouled by the magician's own force, another method must be used, known as absorption. Now, absorption is a very high-grade method, and its successful use depends upon the state of consciousness of the user. Each individual has to decide for himself whether in a given case at a given moment he is in a fit state to attempt it. Unless he can completely steady his own vibrations and arrive at a state of perfect serenity and freedom from all sense of effort, he should not make the attempt. We will, however, describe the method for the benefit of those who care to try it, harmonizing himself by meditation upon the Christ. The adept, as soon as he is satisfied that his own vibrations are steady, proceeds to call up before his astral vision the image of the form he intends to destroy. He sees it clearly in all its details and seeks to divine its nature, whether it is a vehicle for malice or lust or vampiric action. These are the three most common, and it can almost certainly be assigned to one or other of these classes. Having discerned the type of the force with which he has to deal, he then proceeds to meditate upon its opposite, concentrating upon purity and selflessness. If the force be lust, compassion and love if it be malice, and upon God as the creator and sustainer of all life if it be vampiric. He continues this meditation until he feels himself suffused with the quality upon which he is meditating, until he feels himself so imbued with purity and selflessness that lust causes him to feel nothing but pity, malice causes him to feel nothing but compassion, and in regard to vampirism he is so assured that his life is hid with Christ in God that he would willingly let the vampire finish its meal in peace, if he could thereby help it. In fact, the adept who proposes to perform a magical absorption has to reach the point where he has clearly realized the nothingness of the evil. He proposes to absorb and no longer has any feeling towards it, but a pity for an ignorance that thinks it can gain any good thing for itself in this way. He desires to uplift and educate and free the misguided soul from its bondage until he has arrived at the point when he has no other feeling than this towards his persecutor. It is not safe for him to attempt an absorption. Having satisfied himself that he is ready for an attempt, he proceeds to draw the thought form towards him by pulling in the silver cord that connects it with his solar plexus, if it be a vampiric thought form, or by opening his aura to it and enfolding it, if it be one of the other two types. He literally sucks it in. This process should be done slowly and gradually, taking some minutes in the doing. If it be done suddenly, the adept may not find it possible to keep his own vibration steady, and then he will indeed be in an unpleasant situation. As the thought form is absorbed, the adept will feel a reaction in his own nature corresponding to the type of the thought form. If it is a lust force, he will feel desire rise within him. If it is a malicious force, he will feel anger. And if it is a vampire, he will feel bloodlust. He must immediately overcome this feeling and revert to his meditation upon the opposite quality, maintaining it until his vibrations are once more fully harmonized. He will then know that the evil force has been neutralized and there is much less evil in the world. He will immediately feel a great access of vigor and a sense of spiritual power, as if he could say to a mountain, be ye cast into the sea, and it would be done. It is this sense of spiritual exaltation and power which tells him 
that the work has been successfully accomplished. It is, however, advisable to repeat the meditation at intervals for two or three days in case another thought form is formulated and sent after the first. As for the sender of the thought form, when the absorption takes place, he will feel that virtue has gone out of him and may even be reduced temporarily to a state of semi-collapse. He will soon revive, however, but with his power for evil of this particular type considerably reduced for some time to come. And if he have the possibility of reform in his nature, it may even be that he himself will be permanently freed from this kind of evil. The great advantage of this method is that it actually destroys the evil, root and branch, whereas the mere destruction of a thought form is like cutting off the top of a weed. On the other hand, it can only be done by an advanced occultist, keyed up to the highest pitch. If one is disturbed or harassed, or has in any degree lost his nerve, one dare not attempt it. If the rapport is perceived as a line of light, a cord, or any other similar form attached to the solar plexus, the forehead, or any other part of the body, the best way of severing the rapport is to forge a magical weapon and cut it. In fact, if a rapport is felt, the first thing to do is to visualize the cord and try to see where it attaches. The solar plexus is the commonest point. Next, formulate the cross-handled sword as already described and invoke God's blessing upon it. Then visualize a flaming torch and invoke the power of the Holy Ghost, whose symbol it is. Now with the sword, hack through the cord or ray until every shred is severed. Then sear the stump with the consecrated fire of the torch until it shrivels up and falls off from its point of attachment to your body. After such a severing, one must, of course, take the ordinary human precautions to prevent the link being reformed, refuse to meet the person responsible for its formulation, or to either read or answer letters from him. In fact, cut off all physical communications as thoroughly and resolutely as one has cut off astral ones for a period of at least some months. There are occasions, however, when a person is so completely overshadowed and dominated that he cannot perform this operation for himself. The magical operation of substitution can then be performed if he can find a friend ready to undertake the task. In order to perform this operation, the two friends agree that it shall be done, but the one who is to become the substitute does not tell the original victim when he proposes to undertake the operation lest the latter should be so completely in the hands of the dominator that he should give the game away involuntarily. Choosing a time at which he is sure his friend is asleep, the substitute concentrates upon him and imagines himself to be standing beside him and visualizes the cord or ray of the rapport, stretching from his friend out into space. If he can visualize its other point of attachment in the dominator, so much the better. He then formulates the sword and the torch as above described, and with these in his hands, he imagines himself stepping right through the line of rapport, so as to break it with his body. He must not use either sword or torch for this process, but break it with his own flesh, as it were, having thus severed it from his friend. He should then go for it with sword and torch, with all of his strength, as it tries to enwrap him as it assuredly will do, for it resembles nothing so much as the tentacle of an octopus. He should go for it hammer and tongs, making up in zeal what he lacks in knowledge until it has had enough and begins to curl up and withdraw. The combat, of course, takes place in the imagination, but if a clear and vivid image is produced, it will be effectual. Method 4 the idea of the hero who returns to lead his people, the guardian angel that appears in times of crisis, is sealed deep in the hearts of all nations. 
and nothing will eradicate it. Innumerable instances were reported by the men returning from the trenches during the war. Let us again refer to the ancient wisdom of the Kabbalah, that storehouse of occult knowledge. We learn here of the good angel and the evil angel of the soul of man who stand behind his right and left shoulder, the one tempting him, the other inspiring him. Translate the dark angel into terms of modern thought, and we have the Freudian subconsciousness. But the Freudians fail to realize that there is also a bright angel who stands behind the right shoulder of every man. This is the mystic superconsciousness, or in other words, the higher self, the holy guardian angel, whom Abramelin sought with such ardor and effort. I maintain that even as the lower self can rise up in moments of temptation, so can the higher self descend in moments of spiritual crisis. It is the aim of the mystic to live exclusively in the higher self. It is the aim of the occultist to bring this higher self through into manifestation in brain consciousness. In my flesh shall I see God, just as surely as the lower self can rise up and betray us to some horrible deed. So can the higher self come to the rescue, terrible as an army with banners. I have already told of the mysterious voice which instructed me how to extricate myself from grave psychic danger. Upon other occasions of stress and strain, I have experienced the sudden expansion or shifting of the level of consciousness. The higher self has descended and taken control. From being in the midst of turmoil, one is suddenly raised high above it and sees all the circumstances of one's life spread out like a bird's eye view, as one might see the land from a high place, and one knows intuitively the outcome of the matter. All emotional turmoil ceases, and one is like a ship hub to, securely riding out the storm. When this occurs to me, the memory of my past incarnations is always vividly present also. It is this simultaneous awakening of the past which makes me feel that the voice is that of my own higher self and not of another entity. When we change gear from the physical to the astral, we find ourselves upon the plane of psychic consciousness and the lesser magic, supposing a psychic combat is taking place between two occultists, if one of them is of such a grade that he can change gear again so that consciousness is lifted from the astral to the mental plane. He will be in the sphere of the greater magic and be in full control of the situation. The other can make no stand against him, but what happens in the case of the rare and mystic soul, who can shift consciousness once again and engage the gears of a purely spiritual power? He has outclassed the adept. There are many souls who have this mystical, spiritual consciousness, although they have no occult knowledge. Between the higher and the lower modes of thought, there is a great gulf, fixed across which they leap precariously. If in a time of crisis, they are able to rise up in faith and enter into this mystical consciousness and be still, they will have the upper air of any occultist who relies upon nothing save the technique of occultism. The question of mystical consciousness is, however, outside the scope of our present enquiry, which is concerned with psychic methods and the traditional technique of the occultist. Different temperaments will employ different methods, and the mystical method does not appeal to everybody. The occultist does not ignore the Christ force, however. He recognizes it as among the hierarchy of supreme forces of the universe. Although he may not be prepared to assign to it the exclusive position which it occupies in the heart of the Christian mystic. In the Western tradition, it is symbolized by Tifereth, the central sephira of the ten holy sephiroth of the Kabbalistic tree of life. The Christ force is the equilibrating, compensating, healing, redeeming, purifying factor of the universe. It should be invoked in every operation of psychic self-defense, where any human element incarnate or discarnate is concerned. 
where non-human elements such as elementals, thought forms, or the cliff off have to be dealt with, it is the power of God the Father as creator of the universe that is invoked, his supremacy over all the kingdoms of nature, visible and invisible, being affirmed. God the Holy Ghost is the force that is employed in initiations, and it should not be invoked during times of psychic difficulty, as its influence will tend to intensify the condition and render the veil yet thinner. There is a very curious aspect of the occult field concerning which something must be said in the present pages, though not a great deal can be revealed, and to be frank, I do not know a great deal about it myself, but to only such aspects as I have actually come across. I have always heard it called the occult police. Others may know it by different names, but I believe it to be a very real and concrete thing though its organization is not upon the physical plane, nor, so far as I know, are its mundane activities gathered up into any single pair of hands. I have crossed its trail upon a number of occasions and played my part in its activities, and I have talked with others who have also been concerned in it, and they have always said, as I do, that it is the inner voice and circumstances that direct our activities when we cooperate with this mysterious organization. In my experience, it has no particular political bias, but concerns itself solely with occult methods applied to criminal ends and offenses against society.